Ladies and gentlemen, I'm full of optimism. Einstein's theory of relativity. We're still seeing it quite well through that haze. T minus 37 seconds. The fight is going to equals MC. That all men are created About the future innovation. And growing strength in the air. Tear down this is finding your frequency with your hosts jeff spinard and ryan treasure it's time to speak up share your voice and hear from the thought leaders hey everybody it's finding your frequency friday we're coming at you live right here from phoenix arizona this is Ryan Treasure, one of the hosts of Finding Your Frequency, and we have a great show for you guys today. First, I want to remind everybody about last week's show, Shifting Addiction to Passion, where we interviewed Greg Champion, TEDx speaker, uh, who's been in recovery for 20 years, and after almost ruining his life with drugs and alcohol, he got clean and sober and shifted that addiction to passion and uh, has been working and doing great things in that space, so make sure you guys go back and take a listen to that episode, and if you're tuning in on your favorite podcatcher device, whether it be Apple, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, all those fun places. Please make sure you share this with your friends because we want to get this out there. We've got great content for everybody to listen to. Today's going to be a great show. We're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject. How do you make money, right? Passive income generation is extremely important. You know, everybody might have a nine to five, but you should be also probably having a little little side hustle there where uh, maybe you have some stocks and bonds or mutual funds or those types of things that are off to the side making some capital for you as well. So we're going to talk about that subject today with a fantastic guest, Andy Tanner, who's the founder of the Cashflow Academy, a rich dad advisor, best-selling author of Stock Market Cashflow, Four Pillars for Investing thriving in today's markets. And uh, what a what a great person. This guy is renowned, uh, a paper asset expert, successful business owner, author, uh, and investor known for his ability to teach key techniques for stock options investing with a long time passion for teaching. Andy, welcome to the show. Well, Jeff and Ryan, thank you so much for uh, having me. I enjoy uh, your show and particularly you mentioned the last episode with Greg. Um, what a great human story. So I'm excited to be with you guys and so appreciate what you do in, in helping people out. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate it. You know, uh, finding a frequency is all about, you know, that journey, that, that idea of why yep. and how. And, you know, I want to start this conversation off with kind of finding a little bit more about you, Andy, and allowing you to share your experience with us and how you found your frequency in life and in business and decided to do what you're doing. Well, it, it's funny. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a lot of people will say, well, Andy, you know, why do you care so much about the spot market? And I really don't. <laughs> I have a, a sign on my wall in my office that uh, is a quote by Charlie Munger from uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's partner. And it says, you know, if, if, if all you succeed in doing in life is getting rich by buying little pieces of paper, it's a failed life. Life is more than being shrewd in wealth accumulation. So, my background really didn't come from stocks. It came from people. That's, that's what I really care about, much like you guys. I imagine if I were to say, well, do you have a passion about radio? You'd say, well, radio is kind of the vehicle I use, but it's really about people and finding their frequency. And I found the same thing to be true. So that how I wound up in stocks is I was in sales. I uh, went to college and really never found anything I could sink my teeth into. And <clears throat> when, uh, when Al Gore invented the Internet, <laughs> according to him, <laughs> uh, you could trade online. I wound up in a sales job where I would sell software on how to, uh, you know, trade online and all this new stuff with the internet. And through that, I realized that, uh, wow, you know, there's probably not an asset class that are more people involved in that they know less about. And that intrigued me. And, and so really my passion really isn't so much in stocks, but it's the fact that people want to learn how to do it. And I wanted to learn how to do it. And so in, in wanting to learn and wanting to teach and caring about, you know, people want to be secure. They want to know how to do this. And, and that's really where, uh, where we got started is just I, I had to uh, learn it by teaching it uh, in a way. So that's, that's how we got started. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So as you started off in, <clears throat> in sales, uh, what was that like back then uh, with the digital landscape not being what it is today? 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was brand new, and it was in the 90s, and so, you know, everyone became an expert day trader. I mean, you could have thrown darts at the wall and hit hit a stock chart and picked a winner in those days. And so <laughs> people were, uh, you know, everyone was an expert now, right? The, the, the NASDAQ was raging and all these internet uh, startups were, they weren't making any money, but their stocks were going up. And so everyone was an expert. When that all came down in, in 2000, you know, with the crash, uh, people's 401ks got cut in half and worse. And I thought, now this is interesting because, A, if you just did what you were supposed to do with the mutual funds, you got cut in half. And if you're trying to do it on your own, you realized, oh, there's risk in this we didn't know about. And that was a real driver for me to say, well, you know, how can I make a difference? I'm not the brightest guy, but, and it's hard for me to learn things. So once I do, I tend to make them simple. So maybe there's a way I could contribute by, uh, by learning this and teaching it. So that was the landscape. It was pretty crazy back then. Yeah, you know, Andy, I think it's pretty interesting how uh, any individual, including myself, and I'm sure that you can attest that really one of the best ways for somebody to learn something is to teach it to somebody else because you're constantly reinforcing, you know, the the ideas that you read and that you're you're teaching yourselves through teaching others and and with uh, with a little bit of service and passion and a little sweat equity. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned, and you know, not necessarily just in stocks, but I think in in life in general. Oh, it's a, it's a great way to do it. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's almost putting the cart before the horse in a way. And, and it took a lot of years of struggling to figure out things and making mistakes. But I think if uh, you stick with stuff, you, you start figuring out a little bit. You know, it's always a journey. The, the market's never something that, uh, you know, I, I struggle with people that act like they're experts on it. Because if you really look historically, the people who uh, Trump the loudest about being experts on are the ones that are usually wrong in five years. <laughs> so it's it's a moving target for sure. But there are principles that I think a person can learn to give them a foundation to, to, to help them out. Yeah, you know, one thing that you said in your earlier comment was, um, you know, about trial and error and kind of, you know, having to have some failures to have some successes. And I think that, you know, if you really want to learn something, you have to fail quickly, right? The faster you fail, the faster you can succeed. And so as you start to implement certain ideologies or, or ideas, and then those fail, then you immediately know that that doesn't work. So you're not going to do that again. Uh, and I think a lot is to be said in that space. Uh, you know, even myself, when I got into uh, broadcasting uh, lots of years ago, uh, there were some stuff that my school did not teach me, that it didn't prepare me for. Um, and when you put it into a real life scenario, I found myself, you know, really reading a lot of different books and self teaching myself to do a whole bunch of different things that I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily taught at broadcasting school. And you know, here we are, twenty some odd years later, and you know, now now I could I could honestly sit here and tell you that I've had enough failures to tell you I am an absolute expert in the medium of internet radio and podcast. Podcasting. And it took a lot of ups and downs and a lot of a lot of interviews, a lot of hours of prep and um, even some dead air. Right. I had some times where we were doing recordings back in the early times and you know, I lost my place with questions. I, I, I stuttered. I didn't know where I was going next. And, you know, those failures, I think, are what has propelled anybody to become successful today. Can you give us an example how one of the failures that you experienced in, in, in the stock market or in your, in your particular area uh, really caused you to open your eyes and see the light for things that you're doing now. Well, gee, if, you know, if we're going to talk about failures, you know, how long is the show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we should go a long way. Um, there, I, first of all, I can't agree more with what you said. I think school does a good job with competency. Right, you can read. You learn some. You regurgitate it on a test. You're know, confident. I can get an A on the test. But proficiency, uh, that's what the the world demands. And I just remember one particular uh, event in the in the market. I was just learning about options. I was very new, and I I was very arrogant. I thought, boy, I figured this out as, as people often do. And I just remember uh, walking away from my computer and coming back, and I, you know, my wife and I, we lost a pretty nice sum of money, you know, right there. Not, not like six figures or seven, but you know, we we had a pretty significant loss and it stung. And it was a really humbling moment where I realized that, boy, you know, you really have to have a good education continuum where you realize whether you're aware of something, competent, or whether you're proficient. 
and that the, the, the market does not reward ignorance. Um, it's very, very merciless uh, with ignorance. And that was a great lesson. That was the most money I'd ever lost at that, at that time. And it just redoubled my efforts. Like you said, I'm not going to do that again. What did I, what did I do wrong? Uh, what book did I read that was incorrect? And, uh, you know, losses help. And I've lost money in business before. I've had uh, one business fail miserably. Well, I've had two businesses fail miserably. Um, I'm, I've never lost money in real estate, but I've had projects where I made about 25 cents an hour on them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of failures. And I think people, uh, don't, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to fail. You know, most of it's not going to cost you your life. And you'll uh, learn some things, like you said, that you can't learn in school. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Uh, you, you can't be afraid to fail because if you're afraid to fail, you'll never take action. Agreed. You know, and I, I think that's important. You know, speaking of action, uh, I, I heard I heard you were a Utah Ute. Is that correct? <laughs> I uh, I have a claim to fame. I was the worst uh, basketball player <laughs> in the history of the Utah basketball program. The joke I say is this: I, I always say, "Well, I can't jump, I can't shoot, but I could foul." So uh, Rick <laughs> Majerus took pity on me, and <clears throat> I was his favorite player because he would keep me on the bench to keep me safe. Uh, he didn't want me to get hurt. <laughs> so, I, but it was a great experience, uh, and I make I tell you the friendships I made. Uh, back in those days were amazing. And, you know, my coach, Rick Majerus, had a profound impact. Uh, I didn't help his teams much, but he sure helped me. And a lot of those lessons carry over into investing. It's a team sport, it really is. Team sport. Yeah, investing definitely is, um, and and we'll and we'll break that down a little bit more. Uh, I love that you're a Utah Ute. I I still to this day have a T-shirt that I wear on the weekends. That was the time that the Utah Utes were uh, at the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl here in Arizona at oh, the ASU was, Stadium. Was, yep. Uh, hey, I, I was at that game. Yeah, oh, great game. Well, we were at the same place at the same time, and we didn't even know it. <laughs> Look at that the small world. Yeah, yeah my, that was my, a fun team. Urban Meyer, yeah, oh, yeah. that whole bit. You know, um, I, I have a, I have a, I have a love for the Utah Utes. My cousin. Um Keisha Fisher, she was uh, a volleyball captain there on the team uh, several years ago, and they won a championship uh, with girls volleyball over there. And now she's currently uh, the uh, she was the assistant coach at Idaho State University, and then she just recently moved over to be the head coach of a high school uh, in her local town. And so now she's the uh, the sky skyline thunder head coach over there, and uh, she's a, a product of the Utah Utes as well. So go Utes! Go Utes, man! A Utah, I'm a, a Utah man am I for sure. Wasn't very good one, but uh, I still wear the red and uh, still wear the crimson and yeah. white for sure. You know, you talked about investing being a team sport. Um, why is an A team more important than money when you're investing? Um, you know, and tying that back to the Rich Dad Advisors book, uh, you know, more important yeah. than money. Uh, that's such a great question. I'll try to be as succinct as I can with it because it's a pretty thick book, but I would say this. <laughs> I have it on my desk. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's big. Um, when people think about making money, it's very much a self-interest venture most of the time. We think, well, what am I going to get? Uh, what can I do to get something? How can I invest to get something? And one of the paradigm shifts I think people have is when we become wealthy, we actually produce things. You know, Warren Buffett owns Coca-Cola a lot of Coca-Cola stock. You know, they produce uh, drinks and beverages every day for people. He owns, owns Fruit of the Loom underwear. You know, they, they keep our tidy whities when we were a kid. You know, that's, they're producing things. Whether you own the stock or whether you're active in the business, you're a producer. And you're always going to be able to produce more as a team than you can as an individual. And if you look at a guy like Steve Jobs, look what he produced. You know, Bill Gates, look what they produce rather than just what they get. And so that attitude of serving, solving problems, being an entrepreneur or an investor is really about what you give first and what you produce. You can always produce more as a team than you can as an individual. And then the second of all, there's a lot of leverage in that more important money because from a production standpoint, that stuff comes from people, not cash. And so even, even the, in the companies you know, I've started, uh, even the cash flow academy started off not really as, uh, oh, how can we go out and make a bunch of money? We got a team of guys together and said, well, what can we produce that helps somebody out? 
And, uh, and that way you really don't need a lot of money. You need a lot of production capability or PC, you know, what, uh, Stephen Covey calls production capability. So I think that's important. And it's more fun as a team. Uh, teams keep you safe. I have, I, my attorneys and my accountant, Tom Wilwright, um, just, you know, guys like Garrett, you know, you want to go into battle as a team. You don't want to be a solo in, in the, in the world that's out there. It's a bloody world going as a team. So I don't know yeah. if that's too long winded, but, uh, Hopefully it makes sense to people. No, I think it really makes sense. And, you know, we had Tom uh, on the on the show uh, late in 2019 in December and had a great interview here in our studio. He, he came in uh, when we were sitting across from each other. And, you know, that was something that he mentioned, too, about, you know, uh, having a team and something that I noticed that's pretty succinct with the majority of entrepreneurs is that. That entrepreneur knows that if they're the smartest person in the room and of, of their team, then your team's broken, sure. right? Uh, and so you yeah, got to <laughs> surround yourself with the right folks. There was a wonderful entrepreneur in my home state. Her name is June Morris, and she worked for a travel agency and thought, you know, I'd like to do this myself. And so she started Morris Travel, and then she bought a couple of airplanes, turned it into Morris Air, and she sold that company to a guy named Herb Callaher who had a company called Southwest. And they made her, they honored her as entrepreneur of the year. And at that dinner, she grabbed that podium with emotion and she said something we've heard before, but the emotion of it was amazing. She says, nobody does this alone. And there's dragons to slay and mountains to climb. And when you, when you get on that mountain, you look around and you, your heart will swell and you'll miss the eye when you think about the people that, that were part of your team and help you there. So it's, uh, it goes spiritual when you have a good team. It really goes beyond just money. It goes spiritual. It's pretty cool. That's how I feel about the risk that advisor team. Frankly, they're just great guys. You know, Tom, he's a team member, but he's also a friend and a confidant. So I'm sure you felt that when you, you know, when you were with him. Yeah, no, I definitely did. It, it does really feel like that, you know, all of the all of the rich dad advisors uh, that we've talked to, you know, we we talked to Blair, uh, we we've we've uh, talked to Tom, yeah, and so I think all of you guys that we've had on so far have been, you know, absolutely amazing human beings. You guys are well grounded, you know, for the success that the that you guys have had with, you know, selling over two million copies worldwide from this rich dad advisor series of books and. You know, also your own personal successes that each one of you have had with your own businesses. Um, it's it's just a kudos and a testament to who you guys are as human beings. The fact that you're still approachable, uh, you can still communicate at a level that doesn't make people feel like they don't understand what you know. And um, I think everybody appreciates being able to have uh, that level of communication. Uh, so great on you guys for being good people. Well, I feel like the odd man out in that group. When I walk in there and I see all those guys, you know, they're all so smart. I, Tom was an A student. You know, I, I struggled in school. You know, I tr- struggled to stay able to play basketball. And I always say, you know, Tom, you and I have something in common. We went through our whole school career, and both of us only got one B. And so, <laughs> and so <laughs> you know, the, the, those guys, uh, I, I always feel a lot of great gratitude and reverence because I'm certainly the least of that group, no question. And they're just been phenomenal teachers to me. So thank you for for uh, for those kind words because they're they're a special group. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, when I'm I'm looking at your book here, and uh, on the back cover you have a triangle on here, right? And it's uh, product, legal systems, communications, and cash flow. But that's all surrounded by team, leadership, and mission. Uh, before we kind of start asking some questions as it relates to stocks and finance and uh, uh, passive income and some of the you know components that Robert likes to discuss for investment opportunity, um, explain this triangle on the back and how does the team, the mission, and the leadership uh, uh, that's wrapped around the product, legal systems, and communications with cash flow. How, do, how does that work? That's called the business investor triangle. And when someone leaves the idea of being an employee or a self-employed person, they want to go business investing. Uh, Robert wrote a book called Rich Dad's Guide to Investing. And that's when he unveiled this, this icon, this triangle. It's got eight integrities to it. And you said on the outside, there's the leader, the team, and the mission. And that uh, what's really brings the context together, hold a sh- shape. For example, the Rich Dad mission is to elevate the financial well-being of humanity, and we're very clear on what that mission is. And the mission is what will drive you when other things go wrong. You know, it's what makes you not quit. It's what makes gives you the 
the the fortitude to survive the the uh, <laughs> you know the the hurricanes that come. So those are the things on the outside, you know, the leadership, the team, and the mission. On the inside are the more practical things that make the business go. Without cash flow, that's the lifeblood of a company. So that's at the base. Uh, obviously, we have to have great communications, both as marketers, but also inside the organization. Uh, legal uh, is important. Systems are what take you into McDonaldizing things, great systems. And the smallest part of that is the product, um, often. Uh, you know, they say you build a better mousetrap, they'll build, beat a door or pass your door. That's not true. I, I'll bet you and I can both grill a better hamburger than you can get at McDonald's or Wendy's, and I don't think we're ready to take down those franchises yet. So just because a guy can make a <laughs> Subway sandwich uh, doesn't mean he's ready to go into business. So those eight integrities, um, you know, in that BI triangle, I think it gives any entrepreneur investor at least a starting place. Say, well, how do I build my team? Who's my legal guy? Who's my accountant guy? You know, who's who's my uh, uh, for me in my business? I'm not the leader. Uh, I had to get a business partner who's better at that than I am. I'm more of a team member in my own business. So uh, that's where that comes from. Is uh, Rich Dad's guy to investing the the BI business investor triangle. Well, and I think, Andy, that's what makes you a leader, you know, being able to identify that there are some uh, things that you have strengths in um, and things that you have weaknesses in and making sure that you align yourself with the proper team angle to be able to manage the business in the most effective manner. Uh, and by stepping back and being more of a team member, um, that's being a thought leader at the same time. And that's just fantastic. Uh, I want to share. Yeah, it's easy for me. I, <laughs> I can't even remember where I parked my car most of the time. So it's, I need someone else to help me with my business. I can teach. I can teach people how to trade options, but I can't remember where my car's parked. So I need I need all the help I can get with my team. And they're they're a great team. Well, thank the good Lord for GPS. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. You know, I want to kind of shift gears just a little bit and uh, talk about passive income and some of those things. I know Robert Kiyosaki is huge on, you know, being able to create passive income, whether it's through, you know, real estate or paper assets or commodities and uh, uh, those types of things or owning a business, you know. Uh, and so let's let's talk about that in, in, in that space. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's probably the hardest thing for people to wrap their head around is, you know, having some kind of a passive income that's separate from your uh, from your day job, whether you are a an employee who works a standard nine to five job uh, and you have a salary or an hourly position there. Um, I think everybody needs to have kind of what I like to say a side hustle, you know, where whether it's uh, you yeah. have a rental property or um, you have some mutual funds you're investing in. Uh, but I think people don't really know where to start or how much money they need to get started or, you know, how that looks like um, you, you get people, I think that are so caught up in the, uh, uh, in the idea of a debt snowball and some of those kind of ideas yeah. and getting to a place where, oh, I got to have uh, six months of, you know, my bills uh, sitting in the bank earning interest that doesn't even outpace inflation, <laughs> uh, yeah. a, a, you yeah. know, and so I think that's a challenge. And as much as I agree with, you know, yeah, it's good for you to have a, a safety net and a cushion that's kind of sitting there in the event of an emergency, i.e. the emergency fund. But if your emergency fund is sitting there in a savings account and you're making 2% or, and that's at the high mark, if you have a really good savings account, um, what do you do with that capital so it can work better for you so you can outpace inflation, but still have it liquid in case of emergency? Well, this is a really important question, and if I could provide a little context, uh, perhaps might be helpful to listeners, is <clears throat> when you think about a, you know, context is so important. Uh, most seeds are pretty good seeds, but if they're planted in stony ground, they don't grow, or, and if they're planted in good ground, they will. So seeds are pretty important, but the context is even more important than the seeds. So let's provide a little context. The first thing I would say is, is to understand the difference between education and advice. Uh, often we're in, we're very much in a culture of advice where people say, well, Andy, what should I do with my money? What should I do with my money? That's a context in which the seeds will not grow. If, uh, I don't know anyone that's become wealthy without a context of education rather than advice. So let me make that distinction before we get too far, because if someone says, Andy, should I buy gold? And I say, yes they have not learned anything. If, I say, if they say, should I buy spike gold? I say, no, they haven't learned anything. But the moment I say, well, you know, gold's fungible. Well, what's that? Now we're starting to learn. So 
when someone says, you know, Andy, if I have six months of money in my, in my uh, bank account, you know, what should I do with that money? That's an advice question, isn't it? And so I, I, I would warn people of that because the moment you're dependent on advice, you're about to make your advisors very, very rich and, and start with education. So let's think of it this way. If you uh, have money in the bank and you believe that the value of the dollar is going to go down and you know that's true for sure, uh, why would you want money in the bank at that point? Now, see, that's education, isn't it? Uh, I believe that we're printing lots of money. I believe that the value of the dollars can go down, uh, guaranteed. I mean, if you think you're going to need more dollars to buy gas in the future, more dollars to buy food, clothing, medicine in the future, it's just a no-brainer not to have money in savings, which is exactly opposite to most people's advice. So what do you do with that money? Well, if someone says, should I buy real estate, my question would be, uh, well, what do you know about real estate? If someone says, uh, well, what do you think about precious metals? I say, well, what do you know about precious metals? Think about it this way. And I, I don't mean to be too long-winded, but it's such an important question that you ask. Is rather than talking about investments, let's talk about the investor. Uh, I would not recommend my mom do what I do, but Warren Buffett could do it easily. And so even though the investment is the same, is the change in the investor. So when say, people say, well, you know, what should I do with my money? Well, I sell options where I make promises and get paid for them to buy stocks cheaper than they were before. That doesn't really help someone that doesn't know how to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. So it's really, if I'm listening and I'm saying, well, Andy, tell me what to do with my money, that's not a, a soil that's ready for what I have. But if one, someone says, Andy, what should I study? Uh, so I can become that investor, ah, now you and I can help each other. So that's really important. It's not about the invest month and what people buy. It's about what type of investor do I want to become, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. And I think that that's probably the disconnect with the general public when they start thinking about, you know, okay, I've gotten to a place where, you know, I, I, I'm actually having some savings where I can do something with and, and try to exponentially change my life and make it for the better. So that way, maybe I can retire earlier than what I thought I could, or yeah. maybe I can go out and start my own business. But uh, those are all things I think that people think about as they see, I have capital. What do I do with it? Um, you know, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm guilty of that it's myself. Dangerous. Yeah, I'm guilty of that it, myself. It, <laughs> it's so dangerous because, you know, 401ks, give people the illusion that they can become rich without education. You know, if I say, well, I want to be a doctor, I can't do that with education. If I want to be a lawyer, I can't do that by just buying a briefcase. I must pass the LSAT and the bar. And so when people say, well, what should I do with my money? They're already asking the wrong question right there because they're about to lose their money by giving it to someone else to manage. And I've never met anyone that became truly wealthy without learning about money first. So the context shift from advice to saying, hmm, you know, I'd like to become a real estate investor. That's much different than saying I'd like to have real estate, isn't it? Uh, I'd like to become a stock investor is much different than saying, well, I think I'll buy some stocks. And that context shift, when a person gets hungry and excited to learn, uh, then they make the, the, they turn the corner. But when someone says, look, I don't want to learn anything, I just want to be rich, well, that's like saying, well, look, I don't want to go to med school. I just want to be a doctor. I, I don't want to fool with the med school part. I just want to be the doctor. Can I just skip to that? Yeah, I want a sandwich, but I don't want to make it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, for sure. You know, so, I, yeah, I want, to, I, I want to do, you know, I want to learn to be an NBA basketball player, but I want to practice or learn the game, right? I just want the accolades and the dunks and the, the trophies, but I don't want to do the work. And as soon as someone buys into that idea, they're about to make Wall Street very, very rich well, um, because Wall Street will take your money and they will give you the advice and they will, they, they don't do that for free. Um, they win. Well, let, sure. let's talk about those four different types of asset classes for investing that Robert discusses. And yeah. because I think those are, I think those are good starting points as, uh, as educational topics, right? If you um, are, are in a place and you're saying, Hey, I have some money and I don't know what to do with it. Well, you need to go learn about a few things. Like you just mentioned, adding some context and saying, it's not about the investment, but the invest investor. Well, 
if you want to become an investor and you make that that choice and you go, okay, well, what do I need to go start to learn in order to do that? What are those What are those classes of investing where uh, a person should start to learn how they operate? And I guess for lack of a better term, just, you know, understand how they smell and feel, right? <laughs> Oh, I just love how you said that. Um, with the asset classes, it's really almost looking like at a, an education catalog of saying, well, which four things could I study rather than which four things could I buy? So let's talk about that. The first one's the most difficult to study. It's the most difficult to do, but it has the greatest rewards, in my opinion, and that's business. Um, business is the best way to get an infinite return, which means um, you put nothing in and got something out. You know, you divide by zero and you get infinity, right? And so let's say, for example, I write a book and I upload it to Kindle and someone uh, says, hey, Andy's book, that's a pretty good sleep aid. It's non-habit forming. Maybe I'll buy it. Help me with my insomnia <laughs> a little bit, right? And so they buy this book <laughs> and it didn't cost me anything to produce it, right? And so that's a bigger return that you can ever get in real estate. It's a bigger return than you can ever get in stocks by putting money in. So that's always the goal, is to learn how to buy something without having to pay for it, whether it's real estate, stocks, or business. And business, in my opinion, is the easiest way to do that, is to get big returns. So I study business. The second one, which I love, and I have a footprint in all four of these. Uh, it's not as large as some other people, but I like to have a footprint in all four is the second one's real estate, and that's about debt and taxes. Um, to be able to use that leverage um, to reduce the amount of money I put in, again, gets me closer to that infinite return. And so I enjoy real estate. I have a little bit of commercial real estate. I've got a couple of little houses we rent uh, that we own outright and some syndications. Real estate's a great thing to study. The third asset class is the one that, that I help with the Rich Dad team on, which is paper assets. And I'll say this again, if I may. The reason I, I'm not really passionate about the asset class, I'm passionate about the people that are in it because there are more people participating in this asset class with the least amount of education. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, people in business usually know something about business. If I buy a McDonald's franchise, I've gone to Hamburger University, which they require before I do it. They're educated. People usually don't buy you know, a $24 million apartment complex it without knowing a little bit about what they're doing. They couldn't even raise the money if they didn't have at least a little idea of what they were doing. But when it comes to a 401k, uh, we have millions and millions of people putting in trillions of dollars into something they have no knowledge of. So when I say the paper is the asset class that most people participate in with the least amount of knowledge, I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm right on that. I think I'm accurate. So paper assets, stocks, options, mutual funds, bonds, Things like that are what most people get into, but it's always under an advisor. Very few know what's going on. And then the last one, I don't get a lot of cash flow from this personally, but I have you know gold and silver, precious metals. They don't cash flow, but I do feel they protect me a little bit if the dollar will lose value. Now, other people do cash flow. Oil, soybeans, frozen concentrated orange juice. If you buy an oil well and you're selling oil, well, you're in the oil business and you're making <laughs> money in commodities. So those are the four. Business, real estate, paper and commodities are the four things you can study and become uh, an investor. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, just to kind of highlight a couple of those, when you say business, there's, you know, a myriad of opportunities in the business space, you know, whether you're starting a ground yes. up business, you're buying a business, you're getting a franchise, like you said, the Hamburger University, and I don't even need to go to Hamburger University. I know that you and I can make a better burger than McDonald's, but we're not, like you said, we're not going to go take it out. But I, I did, I did have to make sure yep. that the listeners knew that we can make better hamburgers than McDonald's. I think my six year old. There's can. no, I know, <laughs> I know that I can, man. I, not only I can, I often do and that's why I look the way I look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the good old cheeseburger, French fries, and a Coca-Cola is like an American staple, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't look at my basketball days as 20 years ago. I look at it as uh, 100 pounds ago, I think, is a better <laughs> way to put that. <laughs> well, but yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's learning how to do it. So the focus is on learning before we buy things, for sure. Well, speaking of learning, let's kind of keep this in your wheelhouse for this next one. Is since you specialize in the in the paper assets and the people that work in that space, and you know, I uh, 
I, I have a mutual fund that uh, I started quite a while ago and I just put like a couple thousand bucks into it and, you know, just kind of forgot about it and didn't really care that much about it. I didn't try to learn anything about it. I just went to Chase Bank and was like talking to one of the persons there and I said, I'm young. Uh, we can take as much risk as you want. Let's open this up with my 2000 bucks. And, uh, you know, so I've had this, this stock, uh, this mutual fund for quite a while and man, it tanked hard in 08 when all that, you know, real yeah. estate happened, all that stuff. And man, I was like, oh, geez, yeah. I lost all my money. But what I thought was interesting is over the past, uh, you know, since 2008 to to uh, to now, um, you know, 12 years, uh, I've seen some returns on that that I've never seen before, uh, which have been really amazing. Yeah. And I think. Uh, you know, you look at the stock market today as compared to 2008, and I know that there's a lot of naysayers out there and a lot of people that are like, oh, man, you know, we're getting ready for another one of the 2008 things. But when I look at the stock market and the NASDAQ and the S&P are up as so much as they are and having, you know, when you're down 500, but you're at 30,000, you know, that really makes somebody who has some of those assets in play really happy because you see those returns coming. Uh, uh, my wife and I use... Uh, um, a little app called Acorns, right? And uh, it, it, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it takes your dollars that you spend. If you spend a dollar fifty, it'll take the fifty cents that's remaining, charge you two bucks, and put fifty cents in your account. And uh, last night, getting kind of prep for this show, I was like, I wonder what the Acorns is doing for the last two years. And we went and looked at it, and it had a twenty-one percent growth trajectory uh, in the last two years that it never had before. So explain that to us. What is happening in the stock market right now um, that? That's really hitting big for people who are investing in paper. Well, you know, there's a real important distinction to make between capital gains and cash flow. Uh, the way to retire and not work anymore is a function of income, not a function of net worth. In other words, if you had a pension and you retired, now your company's going to send you a check every month. So, your first financial education is understand the difference between your income statement and your balance sheet. Um, what you're talking about is a balance sheet issue. And I get nervous about that for people for two reasons. As you mentioned, um, in 08, that thing tanked and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. Well, if you were young, you're okay, right? You, yeah. you have time for that to recover. But if you're like my dad and he had to retire, uh, he had to retire in 2000 after that crash. Think about this. Now you're spending your money and you're cashing those, those out at a 50% discount, which means you're selling twice as much asset to live off of and your hourglass shrinks, which is why people can't retire. Um, but if you're you know, 21 years old, you got a chance for that to retire, but you're still having to work a job. You don't have cash flow from it. Your net worth is growing, but not your cash flow. So what we specialize in is someone says, you know, I don't want to work anymore and I don't want to wait till I'm 65 or have a long white beard to do it. Well, then you <laughs> don't focus so much on your capital gain, your 21% gain. You're focused on how much money do I get right now? You know, if I have a rental house, uh, I can look at the price of the house and say it's growing 21%. But what I'm more interested in is how much rent am I getting off that every month, right? How much yeah, is it actually yeah. giving me? So my concern with the stock market right now is that you know, we've had an unprecedented uh, 10 years. I mean, the 10 year run is incredible. What I'm very concerned about is that prices of stocks are different than earnings on stocks. What I mean by that is I can look at a company like Tesla, you know, they're just going crazy. Yep. And, you know, yep. their stock is having these huge fluctuations right now. But the question really is how much do they really make? What do they earn underneath? That's Warren Buffett thinking. Um, so I'm very concerned about the prices of these stocks as relative to their earnings because there's only been two other times in history where stocks have been so expensive. If you think about someone in a 401k right now, they're paying more for those stocks than they ever have, so they're buying less shares. Yeah. And they have less asset in their asset column now because that amount of money they've set aside each month is buying less asset because they're so expensive. And you don't want to buy high and sell low. You want to buy low and sell high. So I'm very concerned about, uh, you know, I, I, I look at the president's State of the Union, and he talked about how we're stronger than ever. And I think he's done some good things with tariffs and, you know, getting better agreements with China. Let's tip our hat to where he's done well. 
but he didn't mention the trillion dollar deficit that we have in the federal government. And he certainly didn't mention the $23 trillion on balance sheet commitments we've made in bonds. And he certainly didn't mention the $128 trillion that we promised Americans in health care, Social Security, and other entitlement programs that my kids are going to have to pay for. So I don't believe that our fiscal response or our fiscal situation is as strong as it's ever been. The reports I read say it's unsustainable. I think we're in a bubble, and uh, I think people should learn about risk management so they don't lose this, this money they've gained over these last 10 years in a crash, just like it happened in 2000 and just like it happened in 08. Depending on your age, yep, yep. you might be concerned about losing that, that money up and down. So not to be pessimistic, I just... Those are the numbers I see. Yeah, and, and I, no I don't. I don't be think you're being. I don't think you're being pessimistic at all. I mean, I, in my mind, I, I see it's that. Real. And I see that, and I say, I say this to myself all the time because I, I look at you know, Acorns is just one of the things that we have uh, right with yep. with that we have another mutual fund. My wife and I, and I'm looking at that, and I'm looking at, it, and I'm going, I wonder what the I wonder what the signal is for me to move this to cash. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Because yeah. uh, because had had people yeah. had people known in two thousand and eight that that was going to happen, and you said, okay, at the uh, you know end of two thousand and seven, I'm going to take all of my stock based uh, stuff and move it into cash and put it in a, in a savings account and and let that sit there for the next year well, because I'm going to use it lose it. Uh, I'll, what's your what's your uh, what's your strategy I'll, on that? You know, I'll let her. I'll interject some education on that because that's one of the traps people fall into is saying, well, when do I move it? And the answer is, uh, you don't know and neither do I and neither do all these people that claim they know. They don't know. Uh, we know it'll happen. We know that, that this $128 trillion we owe is going to be brought to bear. We know this deficit can't go in ignored. We're gonna, we know it's going to happen, but we don't know when. I don't know when. So uh, let's do a little education if we can take the time. Uh, Mark Cuban sold his a company broadcast.com to Yahoo for $6 billion in stock. When the dot-com crashed, that Yahoo stock went from 100 bucks to 5 bucks, and yet he made out like a bandit. How did he do it? Did he know the timing? No, he didn't. What he did is the same, he did this the same way that you could do it with your home. Do you have insurance on your home? Of course you do, right? You have insurance on your house. Yeah. Well, do you know, do you know when it's going to burn down? No, no. Or if it's going to burn down? No. But yet if it did burn down, you'd be fine financially. You'd lose some pictures and some maybe some precious, you know, things like some photographs, but financially you'd be fine. Well, I insure my stocks. I insure, you know, one of the th- things I don't like about 401ks is no one insures them. If you have as much money in your 401k, let's say you got $200,000 in there, as you have equity in your home, you're buying insurance Every month to protect your home. Well, what's more likely to happen for your home to burn down or for the market to burn down? So I don't think it's a matter of timing. I think it's a matter of what we call hedging. Yeah, and I think if you have a thirty, if, if you have a thirty-year loan on your house too, how many times is that stock market going to take a tank in that thirty years while you're trying to pay it off? Obviously, the idea is to pay it off earlier than the thirty years, but you know, you do make a very good point about having, uh, you know, kind of a safety net in that space in the event of an, an emergency, right? So I pay a little bit of money all the time. I'm always paying a little bit of money for the choice to sell at a certain price that of my choosing. Now I've controlled the risk, and that's called options. That's why options were – a lot of people think options are risky. Don't get in the options market. Options are – they give you the choice to sell whenever you want to at the price you want to. Now you got to pay for that. But for me, I found that's worth it. That's how Wall Street does it when they're smart. That's how – Warren Buffett does it. That's how George Soros does it. But the people in the 401k don't know how insurance. So think of it this way. Rather than trying to guess when the fire is going to come and my house burned down, spend a little money on the insurance. Yeah, your house should appreciate faster than your insurance premiums. You know, take it out of your pocket. But why would you not buy insurance uh, on your paper assets is beyond me. But the reason people don't do it is they don't know how. They don't know how to have insurance on that stuff. So for me, it's less about the timing and more about, do I have a contract that allows me to sell at a high price, even if the price were to go down low, just like I have a contract that if my house were burned down, well, I get a check for its full value, not the ashes that are <laughs> on the ground, <laughs> if that makes sense. That, that might be a complex analogy, but you know, it's a start. 
Yeah, and I, I don't think that it's a complex analogy. I think it's an analogy that anybody who's a homeowner can really understand. Um, you know, that, that makes a good point. If you have, you know, that, that capital that's uh, $200,000 in your 401k and, you know, maybe you just paid your house off and it's worth two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 or whatever the case may be, depends on where you live. You know, uh, a $300,000 house in Utah is probably five million bucks in L.A. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably is. Yeah, yeah. And so, but if you have that, uh, equity that's built up in your home, you know, you're protecting that with the insurance. And if you have, you know, especially with a 401k, I mean, you've been working your entire life or however long you've been working and paying into that, um, which is your hard earned money that's sitting there. So if you have that hard earned money sitting there, why would you allow uh, there to not be a safety net to lose something that you've worked so hard for that you're going to be depending on when you're ready to, you know, make the maneuver, whether it's retirement or, you know, leveraging those assets for other uh, other gains or other things that you might want to get into, uh, you know, maybe maybe you leverage that to get some commodities and some gold or something like that, right? I know that um, there's well, for, a, yeah, four hundred one ks might be one of the greatest heists ever pulled off on people <laughs> because I, I'm not. That was the first book I ever wrote was my book four hundred one chaos, and it really just shows the other side of it. If people had any idea how rich. They were making Wall Street with that 401k. They would have pitchforks and torches, and they would storm Wall Street like a mob if they have any if they had any idea how much of their money wound up in Wall Street's pocket in all those years putting in the 401k. Here's an interesting thing you brought up. We've had a great market, right? Great market. Here's the statistic that's shocking. The last 10 years of the stock market has been the best we've ever seen in stock market history. There's $7.4 trillion in 401ks, you know, defined contribution type plans. Vanguard has $1.4 trillion of that money. The person at Vanguard, 55 to 65 in their most recent report, the mean, he's got 60000 in his 401k. That's the mean. That's the guy in the middle. That means half the people in that age group of Vanguard have less than that. And uh, that's astounding. Where'd the money go? Well, Ask Van Guard how much they made off that guy. You know they'll blame him, saying he's not saving enough. But that's a very important point you bring up with 401ks. Is people put so much into those, and that stuff can be cut in half, just like it did in 2000, just like it did in 08. And if you're 55 and you don't have another 10, 15 years to get back to even, boy, learn how to learn how to insure that. Learn, 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 learn. So. You get me going on that. That's why I don't have a four. I don't have. I don't have a four hundred one k, Andy. I I, I refuse. I, I don't four hundred one k. You know, I would rather. Yeah, I would rather so take many. take whatever money I have and go buy something that I know that I can. You know, uh, <laughs> capitalism buy low, sell high. You know, one of the, one of the fun I, thing. One of the fun things for me is, um, you know, it's not a, a huge investment opportunity, and, and and it can be a little bit risky. But um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, cars are a, a deflating uh, value, and they are. You go buy a new car, you drive it off the lot. It's not worth any money. But man, do you know how many two thousand dollar cars you can go buy and put three hundred dollars into them, or four hundred dollars, and turn that twenty two hundred or twenty three hundred dollars into five thousand dollars? I'll tell you, people flip houses, they flip cars. Yep. You know, uh, other people flip other things. It, it's you know, it, but what's interesting is, is no matter what you try to do, uh, it really comes down to what. But it always comes back to the same place as what you know. You know, the person who gets in that business and doesn't know what they're doing, uh, they're going to buy their cars at 200 and sell them at 1500 right? Yeah. Uh, or it's at 2000 The guy that knows what he's doing has a business that he can force appreciation. So it is about education every single time. And that if there's one message that I could give to listeners it, that will hopefully resonates with them, it's like, my gosh, it's not what Warren Buffett buys. It's who he is. You know, it's not what uh, uh, a guy like, you know, Mark Cuban buys. It's who he is. It's what he knows or she, you know, in the case of like a Meg Whitman. So uh, it's all about what you know. Yeah, I mean, it's just like Voice America. You don't see us out here trying to uh, uh, talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we will just have conversations about artificial intelligence and broadcast that because that is our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is Internet radio. Our wheelhouse is that. This is where we have studied and became knowledgeable in a particular area. And so it's not what it is. It's who we are. Well, and it, it speaks to what I mentioned with Greg Champion last week, you know, last episode is 
you know, as I was listening to him speak on your show, I was so impressed because I thought, you know, the, the value in the show is what people are learning. And if someone walks away from your show, some people go to a movie and they get entertained and there's entertaining podcasts, but the best shows like yours is where people learn. Like when I loved what he said at the top of the show where he said, you know, it's not about drugs and alcohol. It's about what's inside of that person. I was like, wow, you know, that's really true. What the, well, how, you got to heal himself from the inside. It's not about the chemicals. It's about it, it, what's on the inside of that person. I thought person walking away from that show learn something, right, and gain something. And that's delicious. I, I think some of we us, sure like me, so. struggled in school <laughs> so much. You know, well, we struggled in school so much that organic chemistry, I got the idea that learning wasn't fun, learning wasn't delicious, it was too hard, it was rigorous, it was late nights trying to figure out how to pass an exam with pressure. But once you get out of school and you say, gee, I'd like to learn about money or I'd like to learn about you know, motivation. I'd like to learn about how my mind works. Gal, shows like yours, you know, conversations like we're having right now, that's learning that's fun and simple and real without the rigor of, of uh, the pressure of school that it puts on us so much. So I just love what you do. Yeah, and you make a really good point too. And I think there's a, a lot of people, and I, and I hope that people that are listening understand this, that, you know, these concepts about money, uh, these concepts about emotions, all, all, of, all of those things that are, you know, inherent everyday components of life are, you know, things that are really difficult to learn in school. This is why I, I urge all the parents out there to, you know, sit down with your five-year-old and talk about what a yeah. dollar is and how does it work and how do you make money and how do you, you know, do those things? Um, you'll laugh. I'm in the middle right now of, uh, you know, my daughter's like, well, I want to make some money. How do I do that? I said, I don't know. Well, you need to find some way to make money. Uh, let's let's talk about that. And so she settled on, I'm going to collect cans and I'm going to put those in bags. And dad, can you find a place for me to store these these bags of, of cans? Uh, and so she goes around the neighborhood and and picks uh, aluminum cans up, puts them in, uh, in a garbage bag and we keep them in a nice place in the backyard. And uh, so this is her she's six years old and that's what she does too she wants to make money she's learning it's because and she's gonna learn and she's gonna learn and we've had these conversations and something that tom wheelwright and i spoke about about his kids and you know what when they went to college and they started learning uh you know they learned uh, how to replace like an iphone screen and so while they're in college they have their little side hustle of replacing iphone screens and you know yeah. that is the beginning of nurturing and fostering the idea of being an entrepreneur and understanding how money works uh, uh, and I think all too often nowadays with the absence of home economics in, in high schools, um, the, the, the non-availability of, uh, of uh, any kind of finance or, or personal finance classes, um, it's really up to us as parents to really you know, draw a line in the sand and make sure that we take responsibility as parents to teach some of those things to our kids that they're not going to learn in a private or public education setting. Well, the good news is, is you can have your kids learn more in a game of Monopoly once a week than they'll ever learn in school about money. Or we like the cash flow game, of cash course. Cash flow game, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but those types of learning things, you know, you play Monopoly with your kid once a week, he'll, he'll get it. Okay, I acquire the asset. The asset produces passive income. And uh, it's great, great stuff. So my kids love it. I got two young boys. and yeah, uh, like you, it's it's fun to do that with your kids. Yeah, we love so, playing. Awesome Mon stuff. We love playing Monopoly at the Treasure House. We just got a Nintendo Switch, and the Nintendo Switch has yeah. uh, the Monopoly Jeez. game in it, and so you can. <laughs> it's cool because you can just pass it around, and 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 you it's you can. You, yeah, it's way fun. It's great, and uh, really, really, it, it hyper, uh, it 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 gets into the hyper mode, uh, and yep. it's great. So, Andy, I want to thank you so much, uh, Andy Tanner, founder of Cash Flow Academy, Rich Dad Advisor, uh, best selling author of Stock Market Cash Flow for pillars of investing for thriving in today's market. Andy, thank you so much for being on the show with us. We appreciate it. Make sure you guys go check out Andy's website at andytanner.com. And of course, big shout out to Liz Kelly from Goody PR. Thanks for uh, hooking us up with these great guests. We love this series. Make sure you guys go find the press release online. Uh, it's just the beginning. We've got a couple of more uh, Rich Dad advisors coming up here in the next month and want to thank everybody for being on. Thank you for tuning in to Finding Your Frequency right here on the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Check Check us out at, at Voice America TRN at Radio Ryan One, finding your frequency.net. And of course, you can find wonderful, great pieces of content just like this all over the voiceamerica.com internet talk radio network. Thank you guys so much and stay tuned for the next Finding Your Frequency episode.